Let's pray. Father, set our hearts right this morning for worship. Worship by hearing your word and responding to it. Um, Father, I pray you would do a, a very practical, necessary work in us this morning to, to help us be able to focus. Um, in a world of so many uh, competing distractions and so much busyness and activity and, and stresses and concerns, Father, so many things crossing uh, the threshold of our thinking this morning. Father, I pray that we could center in and focus on and hear from you. And, and Father, as we do, we would grow in our, our love for you, our appreciation for your word. But Father, we would see how you teach us and encourage us and instruct us and build us. And Father, we would, by faith, believe what your word says, and we would build our life on it, our lives on it. And Father, that in spite of circumstances, regardless of difficulties and hardships, pains and struggles, Father, we would trust in you and love you nonetheless. And Father, in every season of life, may we trust in your goodness, your sovereign power, your perfect design, and your desire for us to know you and to love you and be faithful to you and to reflect you well. And so, Father, I just pray this word would just grip us today. I pray we would get it, we'd understand it, we'd trust it, we'd do it, we'd live it, it would become part of us. So we're asking you to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we begin the journey, I guess you could say, through a very interesting book in the Bible, 2 Corinthians. Now, I have to admit, in the beginning, my, my initial decision I, to go through 2 Corinthians was really predicated on the fact that we've been through 1 Corinthians, and I felt like, well, how do you do number one without, without doing number two? Uh, but the more that I, I studied and, and read and prepared, the more I saw so specifically the benefit and value for what's in this letter to us, to me, to you. And, and I pray that the things that you hear would go way beyond information, um, would go way beyond just the, the history and the storyline, but would really get to the heart. Because what Paul writes here is genuinely heartfelt. As you read through uh, 2 Corinthians on your own, you're going to see some of that wounded and deeply concerned passion that Paul has for these people. Remember, remember, this is a church that he himself planted. He spent a fair amount of time there getting the church established. And, and remember the context of the church. I won't belabor this point. For those of you who are here with us as we went through 1 Corinthians, you know that this was a foremost city of the ancient world. In the first century, Corinth was a center of, of shipping and commerce and, and culture. And when I say culture, not godly culture. Many small G gods, all sorts of false religion, and a type of lifestyle that was notorious, infamous, even in its day among other godless cities and people and nations. They used to use a phrase to Corinthianize, meant to be thoroughly corrupted with the sexual culture of Corinth and with the materialistic culture of Corinth and with the self serving religious culture culture of Corinth. I mean, this was about as low as you could go. So it's, a, it's the Vegas of its time, and, and Paul plants a church there. And we see some of the struggles that Paul had with the people as they began to grow up in Christ in the first letter to the Corinthians. They had difficulties with doctrine, things they didn't understand, and because they didn't understand them rightly, they didn't live rightly. They had problems with behaviors and morals that sprang out of their, out of their own life. They didn't have a, a religious background per se. Most of them were Gentiles, and so they were coming out of a very different worldview and a very different sort of lifestyle. And as Paul began to realize more and more, he, through God, through Paul and his obedience, God had planted a church in Corinth, in the city of Corinth, but there was still so much of Corinth in the church, if you know what I'm saying. And that is a constant tension. God wants us to be a church in our own culture, in our own place, in our own time, but we have to be forever guarding ourselves about the culture being so deeply ingrained in our church that we don't look so different or think so different or act so different from the world around us. So this was the struggle. And so actually when you get to 2 Corinthians, the, the Bible describes some other letters. This is really Paul's fourth letter to them. We don't have the first one, which he alludes to in the first letter. In the second letter, he alludes to the third one, a painful letter that he wrote them. It was hard for him to write because of his heart for them and his brokenness over what he saw. 
And then he made a, a visit to them trying to address some of these issues, and his reception was so poor, and he saw how bad things had turned in Corinth, that the teachers there had now, to some degree, some had turned on him. They were questioning his authenticity as an apostle because he wasn't one of those original 12 that was with Jesus. And, and now we see some evidence of repentance happening, and some changes happening. And so Paul now writes this, this final letter to them. And it's really towards the end of his, his ministry life, towards the end of his life as a whole. And one of the subjects he introduces to them, which was as countercultural then and as counterintuitive, maybe I should say, then as it is today, is the theme of suffering. You know, most people, and I would argue then and now, don't have a place where suffering fits in their understanding of life and God and Christianity. At, at, at best, it's an inconvenience. At worst, it's faith-shattering and devastating. And they don't understand why it's there, how it's there, and what God does through it when it's there. And that actually God may be working divine and good purposes in pain and suffering. And so Paul uses his life as an example of what it means to struggle. And all the time, his life is like a living billboard of the whole Christian story. Think about it like this. Here's a picture of both Good Friday and Easter Sunday. The pain and the, the hurt and the struggle and the death, which will lead inevitably to new life and resurrection and everlasting hope. And Paul very securely and clearly shows, this is what God has been doing in my life, but life isn't all about this world. It's not all about my comforts, and it's not all about my, my pleasures, and it's not all about all the things that I want to enjoy with my time here. It is about, it's about God. What does God want to take and do with my life? How does He want to put Himself on display? How does God want to make me a living billboard? And if God chooses pain to do that. If he, use, if he chooses pain to teach me deep lessons, to cause deep hunger for him, to develop deep trust, if, if he chooses suffering to put my life on display so that others see and say, wow, how do you handle that? How do you deal with that? How do you get through that? If God chooses to do these things, then so be it. Glory be to God. Because I know this, I know whom I have believed. I know that he's able. I know the promises he's made to me, and, and I know where this all leads to. And I know that inevitably, certainly, the pains of this life, the light and momentary afflictions, as the most afflicted Paul called them, these light and momentary afflictions cannot be compared to the weight of glory that's going to be revealed. So today I want to I want to launch our study of 2 Corinthians and talk about suffering and the God who responds to our suffering. Now, I don't want to take a survey this morning, informal or, or otherwise, and not ask you to raise your hand or anything, but I have zero doubt in my mind that in this room are hurting people today. I don't mean people who have hurt or have experienced hurt in the past or even anticipate, or I mean, I'm talking right now going through struggles, going through difficulties. And if that group doesn't include you, then certainly those other group, two groups do. You've been through it, you've experienced it, you're recovering from it, you're still scarred from it, or you haven't recovered from it, or it's coming. Where is God in this? What does God intend to do? And over these next couple of weeks, as we look at what, what Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes about hardship and difficulty and some of the terms he uses, afflictions and pains and sufferings, I hope and I pray a couple things will happen. I, I pray that one, as God develops a right, spirit-driven, informed by the Scriptures, built on Christ Himself. You know, God wrote a book on suffering. His name is Jesus. And I pray that as you see Jesus clearly, and what God's Word says about this, that you have a right theology of suffering that will give you the ability to have patient, God-honoring endurance, that will bring you comfort in the midst of whatever and will equip you to be an instrument for the sake of somebody else. So I want you to look at this text with me this morning. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1. 
2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. You'll hear me over the next few weeks reference somebody that is a spiritual hero of mine. In fact, of the people that I've read over the years and the people I've heard speak in person that have had such a profound influence in my life, particularly in this area, there's no one that approaches the life and writings and ministry and enduring testimony of Johnny Erickson Tata. And so, pardon me if I, if I lean heavily on something she's said and done simply because of the insight that God has given her her faithfulness to Scripture, but also the power of a life well lived in the face of suffering. She said this, she said, most people wish they could erase suffering out of the dictionary. Today's culture of comfort and instant gratification has no patience for suffering. Most people want to drug it, escape it, divorce it, do anything but live with it. Isn't that true? I mean, this is not popular stuff, right? I mean, you're thinking, if you want to start a new message series that's just going to capture the enthusiasm of people, you don't start with a passage of Scripture that references suffering multiple times and pain and affliction, right? The world doesn't want to deal with this. In fact, modern Christianity doesn't want to deal with this. So much of the false teaching that we hear today, in fact, speaks contrary to what I'm going to say to you today. That this is not part of God's plan. That God has nothing to do with it. That inflates the power and influence of our enemy and deflates the power and sovereignty and authority and purposes of God. And that's not true. Satan is not the God of suffering that causes everything bad that happens in this world, and God is not impotent to address them or respond to them. In fact, we're going to see something different, that maybe there's something that God is doing that we need to learn and understand and be able to respond to and minister to other people in. So I, I, I put together a few lists to, be our starting point. And we'll talk about this a little bit more of why God uses suffering and how God uses suffering in, in the weeks to come. But let's start here today. Some countercultural or counterintuitive thoughts about suffering and difficulty, hardship in general, the pains of life that you find in 2 Corinthians. The sort of stuff that people don't want to hear, the sort of stuff that much of the world is going to deny, and the sort of stuff that modern pop, particularly prosperity type Christianity, and I use that word loosely, Christianity, in quotes, fails to address biblically. Okay, some countercultural ideas. First of all, we need to look in Paul's writings and see this. We need to see pain and suffering as part of normal Christianity. This is not abnormal. This doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you or that you don't have enough faith or somehow um, your, your faith is deficient, your religion is deficient, or maybe you're not saved. You know, if you watch enough Christian television, you're going to think that, wow, I shouldn't be doing this. There's something wrong. Like, this is something that I've acquired myself. This is a result of my own failures or sins or unbelief, my doubts. And yet, Scripture paints a, a different sort of picture. It's normal. Normal Christianity. It's kind of interesting when, when Paul is defending himself against his critics and those that would attack him as being a legitimate apostle, he does the exact opposite of the kind of stuff you might see in modern Christian ministry today. He doesn't use proof of his apostleship, his successes. Surely God is with me, right? Look at how blessed I am. Surely God is honoring what I say. Look at how he has honored me. Surely God is glorified in my ministry for look at all the glory you see behind me. That is not what he does. In fact, his testimony is actually the exact opposite of that. You want validation of Christ and his call and his work in my life? Look at what I have endured for his sake. Look at what I've been through. Look at what I've persevered in. Look at, look at the pains and the scars. And yet here I am, presumably in, in old age now, still faithful 
and still longing for the fulfillment of every promise I've staked my life on. And his testimony is not a testimony of life's successes, but life's pains. And that's the validation of Christ and his work in him. A, a second thought I would want you to see in this text is right at the very beginning of verse 3. I mean, let me reread it just so that you catch it. How does he start this whole little statement, this, this paragraph on pain? Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. How about the idea of praising God in struggle and pain? Now, now notice what I said. It may seem like an insignificant word, but it's significant. I'm not saying that we do something that simply makes zero sense whatsoever. Praising God for every pain and difficulty. I was reading a, a testimony in an article this week of, well, I was actually reading some things that pastors shouldn't do when people are hurting and things not to say when you really want to be helpful and you want to be a minister of, of encouragement or comfort. You want to be used by the Holy Spirit to, to help somebody and not make things worse. And it was one of the things not to say. A pastor walked into the room, true story, and the lady was writing this in her account. She had just lost her child in childbirth. And I can't think of many worse scenarios. One of the most painful experiences of, of my ministry life um, was with a, a friend of mine, a, a good friend of mine, and also a member of my church when his wife died in childbirth. And I went to the hospital that night right after the crash cart was pulled out and the sobbing up and down the hospital halls and the nurses, and it was a devastating scene. And maybe even worse than that was about a week later, um, the little boy that she'd given birth to died also in, in dad's arms. And he asked me if I would sit with him. We sat there. It's the hardest thing I've probably ever done in ministry. We sat in a little room together in the hospital, and he held his baby for the last time as he turned blue and purple and passed, just the three of us sitting there. And a couple days later, we did a funeral service with a casket about this big. Still today, the hardest funeral service I've ever done. When this lady's account, the pastor had come into the room and she had just lost her child, and his, his words to her were these. He said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You, your child is now home with Jesus. Now, I, I get the theological truth of that. I mean, I get that. You know, that. That was David's encouragement when he lost a child. Um, I won't be with him anymore in this life, but I will be with him again. I'll see him again. But, you know, in, in that in that moment, now that's not what that hurting person needs to hear and, and to understand. And you know, it's not praising God in that moment, in that pain. It's it's being able to praise God in spite of, to know that that God is still going to be good. And, and Paul never lost sight of the goodness of God. And part of that, and, and maybe write this on your notes somewhere, because I'll be hitting this theme again and again. If we don't have an eternal perspective, an everlasting perspective, I mean, if our, if our sight, if our focus, if everything we're about is the here and the now in this life, what I can get out of it and what it's going to give me and what I'm going to enjoy in it, then none of this is going to work for you. There must be something so much bigger that comforts us, encourages us, and gives us hope, and gives us comfort, you know, gives us peace. Here's a third countercultural concept. In the middle of whatever you're going through, have you ever stopped to consider that maybe it's not all about you? I don't think we do that very often. I mean, there's something so interwoven in these texts that it can't be missed. Because God comforts you. He comforts others through the comfort He has given to you. The instrument of, of comfort is so often people, but it's people who have who've hurt. It's people who have struggled. It's people who have been through the pain. It's people who know what it is to weep and to hurt deeply. It's people who, who know what it means to feel despondent and want to give up. Through those hurts, God works with other people. And I think sometimes we get so self-absorbed and so self-focused. And, and probably that's a result of our culture that even though we're so interconnected digitally, electronically, we're disconnected emotionally, relationally. I think it's just about us. Again, I have to share with you this story from one of Johnny Eric Sintata's books about finding hope and suffering. Let me tell you just this little tidbit, so allow me. 
Her name is Shantama. When our wheels team was in India recently, we met this bright-eyed 18-year-old from a Hindu family living in Angoli. No one born in the poverty and despair of the teeming slums of this city has an easy life. But many have had it easier than Shantama. Born with a disability, she spent her life scooting around on the floor of her family's tiny home, dragging her legs behind her and rarely venturing outside her front door. The message of good news in Christ, however, has permeated this coastal city of 300,000. Four years previous to our meeting, Shantama, an evangelical pastor from a small church, made contact with the family. When he learned of her condition, he went back to his little office, picked up his tattered copy of an old book out of his meager library, and bought it to the young woman as a gift. Although a Hindu her whole life, Shantama read that book cover to cover. With tears running down her cheeks, she made up her mind to trust in Jesus Christ, just like the author of that book, Johnny. In fact, she read that book eight times, rehearsing over and over how a person could come to salvation through Jesus. And finally, that's exactly what she did. In a big decision that undoubtedly had consequences within her family and her community, Shantama left the Hindu religion and became a Christian. And then our team came, bringing wheelchairs and Bibles to Angoli to deliver to needy, disabled people. After all those years of crawling and dragging herself from place to place, Shantama learned to her wonder and delight that she was to receive her own wheelchair. The chair, however, had an excitement for her that way, went way beyond the gift itself. These were followers of Jesus who were giving these wheelchairs to people. She was so proud and excited to think that the God she had learned to trust from reading the Johnny book so many times, that this God, her own book, her own God, was showing her the special kindness and providing opportunity for her to receive an actual wheelchair fit just for her. After she was finally fitted for a chair, however, she was shocked and stunned to learn where the chairs had come from. She burst into tears when she realized that these wheelchairs were sent by her very own Johnny from so far away. Since that day, Shantam has experienced a new level of joy and confidence and has become more emboldened to share her faith in Christ with friends and neighbors still locked in the Hindu religion. She said to one of our team members, I am ready to go wherever God leads me in this wheelchair, just like Johnny. My friends, this is one of a million reasons why I'm grateful God didn't heal me of my paralysis. What if I had been healed at that crusade back in the early 70s? What if God had answered my prayers as a 17-year-old, released me from my paralysis, and returned me to a normal life of a woman on her feet? It might have been well for me, but what about Shantama? There would have been no Johnny book for the pastor to give this young woman with so little hope and so few prospects, and there would have been no Johnny and friends or wheels for the world to do a wheelchair distribution for impoverished people in Angoli, India. She goes on and on to talk about the sovereignty of God there, but to begin to see your life as something more than about you and your suffering is more than about you. And maybe in your suffering, God has a grander and bigger purpose. And what about this theme? What about suffering by God's design and per part of God's plan? Again, it's contrary to what, and, I, and it's easy for me to say it's what the world thinks because I really don't care. What I do care about is what a false version of Christianity thinks. That suffering is never part of God's plan, that it, it, it's never what God is doing, that He is never the cause or the allowance for, that it's always against His will, that it's always because the enemy's working, and that, and that God just stands waiting. If you have enough faith, if you'll claim the right things or say the right things to remove it from you, and I stand against that, this is not true. Paul's life is a validation and verification of that, and so much more so is the life of Christ. What about this as your future? Instead of this future of pursuing joy and happiness and, and finding your satisfaction in this world, what about, what about this as a potential future for someone who suffers? A future of patient enduring. Well, what if that's the future God has? Can you love God nonetheless? Can you follow Him still? Can, can you be faithful to Him if that's the future? If the future is a wheelchair? Or a heart condition? Or a devastating loss that you must recover from that, that you won't forget? the rest of your life? What if that's the plan? Can you still love Him and trust Him? And then here's something that's a little bit counterintuitive to us. What about a life of faith that's actually genuinely based on the truth because we know the truth and we believe it, so we build our confidence in God on those things rather than experiences or circumstances? You know, what if our faith is built on this is what God has said, this is true. I may not see it. I may not understand it. It may not even cause me to have the feels about it. 
But I'm not going to let my idea of God, and I'm not going to let my idea of Christianity, I'm not going to let my life be simply based on my circumstances. And if I want to know, does God really love me? Does God really care about me? Is God involved in my life? I don't have to look any farther than what God did for me in Christ. I know this. I know that I'm loved. God demonstrated his love for me. And that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. And I know that he's called out to me. And I know that he has promised when I have put my trust in him to love me with an everlasting love. And I know my circumstances don't tell me the whole story. You know, that God is weaving something together and putting something together that's far bigger. Now, perhaps one day we get to glory and we see the full picture of this tapestry that God has woven with our life. Maybe one day we won't even care. Maybe the glory will be so great, the goodness so vast, you know, the picture of God so amazing that everything that we've left behind will be absolutely immaterial to us from that point forward. I don't know. You know this passage describes something about God. I, I didn't know ex exactly how to describe it. I thought, I've got to write this down in your notes because I want you to see that when Paul talks about God, he doesn't simply talk about what God does. He does say that this is the God who comforts us. But it goes beyond that. Comfort is part of of the absolute, essential, immutable nature of God. He says, praise be to God, and he gives him two names, two titles. The Father of mercies. He's the Father of mercies. You know, when we start talking about suffering from a right theological viewpoint, and we ask these questions like this, why do did, why did bad things happen to good people? All right, How many of you have ever had some form of that question ever sent your way. Help me understand now why bad things happen to good people. To not sound so totally defeatist and absolutely negative, you and I need to have a starting point, biblically, theologically, that recognizes there are no good people. The only time something bad happened to something good was the means by which all of us are saved. And that's when Christ Jesus was crucified for our sins. But by me saying that, that doesn't mean that there's a direct and obvious and visible, traceable correlation between my bad and the bad things that happened to me. Okay? You follow what I'm saying? I, I can't do that. I can't do it in your life either. Well, that wouldn't have happened if you hadn't done this. Well, some things are obvious, right? You drink and drive, you hit a tree. Listen, I'm not going to sit there and say, well, this must have been the will of God for your life. No, this must be because you're an idiot. You see what I'm saying? You know, sometimes we pray for God to take away pains. I don't know why I'm suffering like this. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Your parents told you, and you did it. Your, your, your wife said, don't do that, and you did it. The Bible said, that's not what I'm talking about here. What we need to understand as a starting point is we live in a world of brokenness and pain. And we live with each other's brokenness and pain. And I live with the effects of my decisions, and I live with the effects of yours, and those before me, and those around me. And it is impossible for us to trace a line, to connect the dots between everything. We just simply can't. There's brokenness. There's brokenness everywhere. That's why we need a God of mercy. Because if God treated us as our sins deserve, we would all be suffering, except our suffering would be infinite and eternal. We need a God of mercies. We need a Father of comfort. This is who He is. The Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. So how does God do this? Let me share with you just for a moment how how God comforts us, because I don't want you to miss it if God is doing it. I want you to be able to recognize it. And I want you to be able to thank God for it. I want you to be able to be as Paul was. I want you to be able to praise Him. Because you understand how He does bring about comfort. First one I want you to see is this. God comforts people through people. He comforts us through people. That's clearly, that's clearly what's being taught in this first section of the first chapter of 2 Corinthians. The normative mode of God comforting people is through other people. So what does that say, first of all, to the disconnected person? And when I say people, let me offer a little sharper focus, a little more clarity. So let's take that lens and dial it in a little bit. The type of people he's talking about here is a specific type of people. He's talking about Christian people. He's talking about spiritual comfort. Spirit to spirit, life on life, a Christian comforting another. He's talking about the church. So often people today say, you know, I don't need a church to be a Christian. 
No, I don't need a car to be a driver, but it sure helps. You know, this is exactly why you need a church. Because it is through people that God ministers to us. It's through people that, that God expands us, gets us out of our own tight little packages centered on self. It's, it's through people that love is known and shared and ministry is accomplished and generosity happens and encouragement comes and edification and teaching and strengthening and accountability and the list goes on and on. So many one and others that happen only in the context of other people. God does it with people. And just think how this is ideally supposed to work, even for the hurting person. The person waiting for the comfort to come. Listen, if you will be an instrument of comfort for the sake of somebody else. You know, sometimes the system is broken. Why? Because we're broken. So it doesn't work for me. No one's comforting me. I'm sorry. It doesn't mean that's not the way it's supposed to be. It doesn't mean that those people that you're not in community with, your life group, your brothers and sisters in Christ, the people you sit with in a church, and by the way, you're going to find it hard to find comfort in a room full of hundreds of people. You're going to have to be in relationship with people, real relationship with people that know you and, and care about you, but it should come through people. We'll come back to that a little bit more. God also comforts us with the promises He gives us. He comforts us with the promises He gives us in the Word. And this is so critical, and you're going to see this again and again. Paul references back to points of truth. When I'm struggling, will I go with what I feel in that moment, what my, my clouded reasoning will come up with, you know, will I go with, with what my anger causes me to see or what my tears enable me to, to feel? Or will I go with, but this is what God says. And, and I know for a Christian, frequently there's going to have to be a, a preaching to yourself of, I feel this, I think this, but this is what God says. This is what God has promised me. That's why Paul will write later in the same book, so we don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. This light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are, uns for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And then in a way that's very hard to make a list of and put it onto a piece of paper on a Sunday morning sermon, set of notes. God comforts us by His Spirit in us. He comforts us by the supernatural work of His Spirit, who again, bears not simply the responsibility of comfort, but the title of comforter. That God does a work in our spirits. How will you experience that work? In prayer? In Bible study? In quiet and solitude and meditation? Not when you're trying to do all that you can to eliminate the pain. Not when you're trying to not think about the pain. Not when you're trying to mute the pain. But that when God is ministering you, you begin to think on and consider the goodness of God. And God's Spirit does a work in us. But since I can't control, nor you can control, how God comforts through His Spirit, and the comforts of His Word are there and apparent if we'll read the Scriptures, and so many good ones there, I want to give you a couple thoughts before we close today. Some practical things about how God uses you and how God will use you if you're willing to bring comfort to other people. Okay? So you're ready? I want you to write fast. I'm going to try to give you some practical stuff here that I hope will help you. you got somebody struggling. Somebody's bringing you something. Somebody's telling you their story. Um, somebody's going through crisis or hardship or difficulty or whatever it may be. What do you do? You say, God, I want you to use me. I want, I want to be an obedient participant in your plan, exactly as you've got described right here. How might I do it? Let me give you a few thoughts on that. First one is this. When you're talking to someone who's hurting, be careful that you don't dismiss their pain. You don't dismiss their pain. You know, like when, you're, when your children are small, you may have a tendency to do this sometimes, and it's certainly fitting sometimes. You know, your kid gets hurt or whatever, they fall, and first thing you want to do particularly if you have a hypochondriac one like I have, is um, you want to do all that you can to minimize their sense of pain and suffering here. Um, when Daniel was little, and he's not here so I can say this, he'll listen to it later and enjoy this thoroughly. Um, when Daniel was little, Cecilia and I were in the house, he was in the backyard, and we heard his awful sound and screaming, and apparently Daniel had completely impaled himself on a stake of some sort, coming completely through his torso. 
When we got out there, it turned out to only be a bee sting. <laughs> and, um, you know, we knew at that point with, with Daniel that, okay, you know, our first response is always going to be, hey, it's no big deal. And even if it was a big deal, you know, we would play it down, you know, like, hey, it's no big deal. That's just a little bit of blood, <laughs> you know. And it, it came back to me badly as a, this is a bad parent confession, two different times in Daniel's life, because I, I sort of pegged him as like, Daniel, come on, it's not that big of a deal, get over it. We were, I was his basketball coach in the eighth grade, I was his middle school basketball coach, and there was a play in the game, and uh, Daniel got hurt, you know, and, and if you've ever played basketball, there's nobody that's ever played that hasn't had a dozen twisted ankles and stuff like that. So Daniel twists his ankle and, and hurts, and, and so we get a timeout, and I get the huddle in, and Daniel's still out there, and I'm coach in the huddle. And so I'm telling Daniel, get over here. And drama king as he is, this is no lie, so he can tell you, from about the free throw line over there to our huddle here, he crawls. <laughs> He's crawling. Dude, you've got to be kidding me. Get up. Okay. His foot was broken. <laughs> That's true. I'll give you, I'll give you one more. We're on the phone with Daniel, and he's getting ready to go to a youth event. He's going to ride with our youth pastor named Jeff. He's over at Jeff's house, and he's getting ready to get in the back seat of the car. While he's on the phone, we hear Daniel yelling and screaming again. Oh, good grief. What, you know, what, what is this? You know? And he's yelling and screaming, Jeff ran over my foot. He ran over my foot. Daniel, get in the car. Again, foot broken. <laughs> Twice. Twice. But I want to say to you, sorry for that comedic interlude. Um, be careful when somebody's hurting that your response to them isn't something like this. Well, at least it's not. And fill in the blank. Well, it could be worse. Well, well sure it could be. Well, what, what, is that the point at that moment? Here's one that we say sometimes often to people. Oh, I know what you're going through. Do you? I mean, that, that might be true sometimes. How about this one? You're going to be fine. Oh, you're going to be fine. You know, not everything turns out fine. Not everybody is fine. Don't dismiss their pain. Don't, don't minimize it. For that person hurting, whatever it is, whatever that struggle is, whatever that difficulty is, that's real for them in that moment. And we don't demonstrate love. We don't demonstrate compassion. We don't demonstrate Christ by dismissing it. Which reminds me of the point number two, which is similar to the first one. And that's don't offer empty cliches. Christians are notorious for band-aiding situations answering deep theological questions, and addressing difficulties with ridiculous cliches. That if you really think about them, they don't mean anything. And a, a person less Christian than us won't receive them so well. So be careful when you say things like this. Hey, what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. No, sometimes it kills you. <laughs> there are diagnoses that will kill you. And to tell that person, oh, it's just going to make you stronger. How was that a help? God won't give you more than you can handle. Tell that to a dying person. Tell that to a broken person. Oh, this too shall pass. Maybe not. And that's really not the point. And then this one, which I, I, I hesitate to say it because it's true, but with an asterisk. You know, it's all part of God's perfect plan. Yes, but is that the moment to simply dismiss the pain and the hurt? Say, ah, it's all, oh, okay, what's well, good then? Now, it's hard to understand, hard to respond at that moment. And I'll offer you a third that's related to that statement. Be so very careful as a Christian that in those critical moments of someone's hurt that you don't lie about God. You'll be healed if you have enough faith. You know, listen, you just need to have enough faith. And you'll be healed. I've watched more hurting people go from spiritual hurt, I mean, go from physical and emotional hurt to deep spiritual hurt because someone had convinced them of that. That the reason they remain in their suffering and their pain or whatever it may be is they didn't have enough faith. God wants everybody to be healed. Of course, it's God's will to heal you. Again, true, but with an asterisk. Because maybe the healing happens upon death and deliverance from this broken body. That's when God heals. That's when I'm set free from its pain and limitations. Or this one. We don't often say this, but sometimes we hint at it in clumsy sort of ways where we imply, you know, 
much like Job's counselors. Again, we won't say it so directly, it'll be an end around, but something that causes them to feel or think their suffering is because of their sin. You think maybe God's trying to teach you a lesson? Or we begin to try to link cause and effect. You know, if you hadn't done that, maybe. This is number four. Don't assume cause and purpose. I mean, I, I get it, and I want you to believe it, that Romans 8.28 is true, right? We, we know this, that God is at work in everything. God works everything together for the good of those who love Him or call it according to His purpose. Listen, I get it that that's true, and that you know it's true, but you don't know in every situation how it's true. Do you see what I'm saying? And don't think you have the divine vision or insight to be able to tell someone how it's true in that moment. Now, later, there'll be a time where that will be their encouragement. In fact, you're going to see, you say, well, you're contradicting yourself because you quote that verse in just a moment. No, I get it. That's foundational and fundamental for a Christian to know that somehow God has not taken his hands off the wheel and he's still working out something. But never assume that you can figure out the how or the why. Well, this is what God is doing. This is how God is doing it. We don't know that. We can't see that. So we can't play God. So don't do those things. But things you can do. In that moment, do pray for their relief. That's the right thing for a Christian to do, to pray for someone's relief. And when I say pray for them, I don't mean to give them sort of that spiritual stiff arm. Oh, I'll pray for you. you know, somebody you know, pours their heart out and all the stuff they're going through and everything, say, oh, I'll pray for you. Stiff arm. I mean, honestly, pray then and later for them. And then check back with them. And how are things going? I've been praying for you. How, how better can I pray for you? Anything specific I can pray for you? Then pray then again with them. Pray for them. Pray for their relief. Do remind and encourage them with Scripture. One of our church members who passed, Betsy Keaton, not so long ago, um, you know, I, I'm not different than you. You're in that situation where someone is not going to recover and you know, the cancer is going to have its final effect here in this life, but not an everlasting one. You know, I don't have a magic wand in that situation. I don't have some magic words to say. So I sat there in the room. I said, you know, can, I just, can I read some Bible verses to you? Can I just read some Scripture to you? I don't want to underestimate the power of God's Word to communicate God to people. That God's Spirit uses that. God uses His Word. Don't underestimate its power. To read to someone, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 34, 18. Or to read Revelation 21 and the new heavens and the new earth and all that God does for those that inhabit it. Or the purposes of pain in 1 Peter 4. Or Jesus' statements about the certainty of pain in John 16. Or the strugglings in this life that are temporary to serve as a witness and testimony to His goodness in Hebrews 12. Or Romans chapter 8. Which tells us about the certain sovereignty of God that God is in control. Use these, use these scriptures to encourage. Next, I would encourage you to offer practical help. Real practical help. If there's something you can do, do it. Not the generic, hey, if there's anything you need. But to discern wisely and to inquire specifically, how can I help? What can I do in this moment that would help me bear my brother's burden, bear my sister's burden? What can I do here? Next, do share your story. God doesn't waste hurts. Some of you got some stories to tell. And sometimes those stories of pain and suffering are by your own choice. But you found healing and restoration. You found forgiveness. You've been through pain that was self-induced. Some of you have been through things that was not at all that you can trace because of you. Share your story. Be careful not to compare. You know, I see that sometimes. You, know, you sit there in the hospital and somebody's sitting there laid up and you know, they're in full traction, the legs up in the air, and they can't turn their heads. Oh, man, but let me tell you what happened to me once. Not the time. Not the time. But later on, you can say, listen, you know, I've, let me tell you what, what God did in my life. Let me tell you a really rough spot of my life. And let me share you my God story in that moment. And let your testimony encourage. And finally, I would say this. Make sure that we offer tons and tons and tons of grace. Tons and tons and tons of grace. God, as C.S. Lewis said, is often shouting to us in our pain. He's shouting to us in our pain. Um, as we'll see next week as we talk about some of the God purposes in pain, there are so many to get our attention, to 
create a sense of need and dependence, to make us long for something better. But knowing those moments says pain makes us able to hear differently that what people hear is grace. It's grace. Listen, we all deserve pain and suffering and death, but Christ. It's the songs we sang this morning. It's the heart of God for us. Here's what we deserve, but here's what Christ offers us. Grace, grace. Listen, we I messed up so bad. Well, let me tell you about what repentance looks like and what ensuing grace gives. You don't have to be that. You don't have to wallow in that. You don't have to punish yourself for that. You can be this. Well, whatever it may be, let's make sure we're lavishing lots and lots of grace. Grace is not just God's forgiveness for what we've done. Grace is a supernatural empowerment of God so that we're not who we used to be anymore, so that we live differently, so we're giving grace. Next week, we'll kind of revisit this in sort of a part two, of developing that personal theology, theology of pain. What is pain for, and how does God use it in our lives? You know, if you're listening here today and you're hurting, God doesn't just comfort. He's the Father of mercies. He's the God of all comfort. Turn to Him. Turn to Him. I pray that someone in this room will be a tool in, in God's hands to be a comforter to you. And I pray that you turn to Scriptures, not turn away from them. Not in this moment. Not in this moment. Where you may be in your flesh tempted to turn from God, turn to Him. Turn to His Word and let Him work a supernatural work of comfort in your life. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I pray you speak to us today your will for us, your comfort to us. Father, there's a hurting person in this room. They would not run from you, but run to you. Father, you make us sensitive to the needs of, the, of people around us and the hurts of them, and we'd be attentive to them. Father, we'd be active in them. We'd be a real church, real brothers and sisters, a real body to one another. Father, if there's anybody in this room that has never embraced you as Savior, King of their life, that's never turned to Jesus and said, my life is a mess and I'm a sinner and I need God to forgive me and I want God to change me and I don't want to live this way anymore. I want, to, I want to know and follow Christ. I want to know and follow Christ. I want my past forgiven, my sins taken away. I want my life to have a sense of purpose now and I want to know where I'm going to spend my eternity. I want to, I want to love and follow Christ not love the stuff of this, this life anymore. Father, I pray you call, some, call someone out today to follow you, to leave this old behind and know that you are a God of all mercy, a God of all comfort, and you're a far better Savior than they are a sinner. And if they'll come to you, you'll receive them. You'll take away their sin. You'll adopt them into your everlasting family. They will become your son or daughter and you'll become their father king. You'll never leave them or forsake them. Your Holy Spirit will be inside them to comfort them, to guide them, to reshape them into what you want them to be. And one day you'll take them to be with you forever in heaven. So Father, I pray they would come. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.